Hello everyone, I'm Donnie Swaggart and welcome to today's episode of The Story Behind the Song. This is where we share with you the history of how one of our great hymns came to be written or we share the story of the writer of this hymn. You know, many of these great hymns, because they were written so many years ago, the, the writer, the author, has been lost to history. I've often wondered, especially today, on the hymn that we're going to be bringing to you, as I was looking at it and thinking about it, it was written so long ago, and it really did not become famous until after the writer had died several years after he had died. And I was thinking this morning before daylight as I was out walking out, I, I wonder if the Lord in heaven allows these individuals that have no idea of the contribution they made to the church and the work of God by a song that they wrote that did not become on the consciousness of the church until after their, after their death. And I, I was just wondering, does, does the Lord somehow let them know what they've done? I was thinking about Jeremiah, the only righteous prophet in the entirety of the nation of Judah leading up to their uh, destruction and captivity by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Forty years he prophesied. Forty years he gave an altar call. Forty years he called Judah and Jerusalem to repentance. But he was ignored. What faith to continue to proclaim the word when there is no response. I wonder if when he got to heaven, the Lord gave him a little bit of insight that the prophecy given to him is still being proclaimed today. Now take that back to the song that we're going to bring to you today. I want to read a passage of scripture because it's really what this hymn came to be based upon. If you have your Bibles, you can grab it and open it to the book of Revelation. And we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 4. Now, I want to read it to you right now with just a few verses. Beginning in verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 4. And the four beasts, and each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is, and is to come. And when those beasts who give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him who sat on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. Of course, this is speaking of the worship that goes on around the throne as not only these created beings, not only the angels, but the saints that are in heaven as they kneel before the throne of God. Their prayer is all the same. Their adoration is all the same. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. To me, some of the most precious words that one could ever read, one could ever speak, one could ever preach upon. Reginald Hebner was a name that, and is a name that I doubt very seriously that any of you watching or listening have ever heard. He was born in 1783 in England and he would die in 1826. That's why I, I said earlier that so many of the backstory of these songs are lost to history about the individuals because they lived so long ago. 
Reginald Hebner was, was born to a family of influence, great wealth. They had great hopes for him. Uh, nothing was kept from him. He had everything at his fingertips that one could imagine to enjoy life, to grow, to, to meet his needs. He was a brilliant mind. Matter of fact, he, he went to Oxford to go to college and started college when he was 17 years of age. 17 years of age. At that time, there were no greater institutes of higher learning than either Oxford or Cambridge. That was the pinnacle of education in that day. While there, Reginald Hebner had a great encounter with the Lord, gave his heart to the Lord and felt led to go into the ministry. He finished his education, was ordained as a pastor in the Anglican Church of England. And for 17 years, he pastored a little church in the city of Hodnet, England. I don't even know where that is. It was very small, very humble, never had great crowds. I really, to this day, don't know in all the research that I've tried to do, uh, I've never been able to find out if Brother Hebner possessed great preaching ability. I, I just don't know. But I do know this, that if, if there had been great promise there, that no doubt the Anglican Church would have moved him out of this little town, as I said, that I've never heard of, and moved him into a town much larger, a congregation, a church much larger, because that's just the way that it's normally done in those type of situations. Finally, at the end of 17 years of passing, in relative obscurity, the Anglican church came to him and asked him if he would go to India and that he would be over the Anglican work that began in Calcutta, India. I have been to Calcutta. Calcutta, there's no words to describe it. It is a landmass created for about 2 million people, but yet nearly 15 million people live in Calcutta, India. Mm. The poverty is beyond our imagination. So many people that have no place to live that literally that when the sun begins to set, those in the lower caste system who have no home, no place to call their own, they literally stop where they are and lay down and go to sleep, whether it's on the sidewalk, whether it's in the dirt on the side of the road. I remember that when I was there in Calcutta, I woke up very early, actually before daylight. I got dressed and I walked into the lobby of the hotel and I walked out the front door of the hotel. And as I said, the sun was just rising. It's, it was one of those moments in time that you'll never forget because as I was standing there a huge truck began to drive by very slowly it was open you could see what was in the back and it was one of those things that you you see it but it takes a moment for your mind and your brain to process because that truck was full of dead bodies Ooh. I'm talking hundreds Ooh. of dead bodies bodies. Oh, Lord. I saw their eyes, some of them open, oh, Lord. lips that were purple. I stood there in shock and the doorman who was dressed as a Sikh, he, the long beard wrapped around and the turban on his head, spoke perfect English. He said, this is what happens every morning in Calcutta. He said, we have to send trucks all over the city wow. 
to pick up the dead that died during the night. Most of it from tuberculosis. I didn't make it. I just stood there. The truck was moving so slow and, and then behind it came another one. A little later, another one. And I, I, I'm not exaggerating. Literally bodies thrown in the back of the truck. And I am looking at this until my senses were overloaded and I had to leave. It was in that kind of environment that Reginald Hebner came to Calcutta. He began to preach. He was over the, as I said, the Anglican church there in, in Calcutta, but also he had duties in Australia and the little country of Ceylon. He was working daylight to dark. The heat in India is very, very oppressive. Oppressive. And one day preaching outdoors to a group of Indians, the sun was so bright, so hot, that as he preached, he began to suffer from a sunstroke, and he, yet he refused to stop preaching, and he finished his message. It so affected his health that for about three years, he was basically able to do nothing, and then he died. On the surface, one could say that his life and his ministry was a failure. He had no great accomplishments that they could point to during his service in Calcutta and other parts of India. No huge churches were erected. There was not thousands of converts, one to the Lord that they could all point back to. In essence, in most thinking, he died a failure in ministry. Reginald Hebner was a prolific writer. He wrote poems, short stories, but he also enjoyed writing hymns that he didn't share with anyone else. They were, they were really for the pleasure of him, his family. After his widow returned to England, Brother Hebner had no great retirement package. No, the family had lost the breadwinner. They, they needed income. Right. And through the help of some friends, she published a little short book of poems and hymns that her husband had written. They sold them at a very modest price. And to be honest with you, most people that bought them bought them out of pity to help this widow and her children. Right. There was one song, though, that they began to sing in a church in England. Then others began to talk about it. And then another church picked it up. And then another church, and another church, and another church, until it had spread all over England. It began to be sung in other parts of the world and eventually made its way here to the United States. It's one of my all-time favorite hymns. And like I say, Brother Hebner died not knowing that the words he would pen and put to paper would one day be sung, not by hundreds, not by thousands, but by millions, millions. and would be in every songbook, no matter the denomination. That's the story. Now here's the song. i 